from the big picture to the smallest detail, from the universe to the building blocks of life. The cellular machinery is a wonder of nature. All the instructions needed for its operation are already contained in our DNA. A code of billions of molecules long, which we barely understand, and that is a crucial factor in diseases like cancer. Understanding allows us to move on to the next stage, healing. The objective of our simulations in the clinic would be to actually test different drugs thoroughly and how they actually behave and how they affect the hearts. Uh, so we can actually reduce a lot the number of people that go through clinical testing since we will already know quite a lot about the basic uh, effects and the behavior of them. 2,400 years ago, Hippocrates stated, it is far more important to know the person who has the disease than to know what disease the person has. Today, we know that drugs act differently on each individual. Our next step will be to design personalized medication. Personalized medicine is actually very possible. One of the things uh, we can simulate is the effect of drugs in female or male hearts. They actually behave quite differently. So this is very, very feasible to do, to be able to recreate a single human heart from a patient and actually help with the diagnosis or with the understanding of the underlying disease that they have. So as a scientist, I've always been interested in the tiny differences between individuals, those little differences to our genes and our proteins that make us who we are. And when I came to join AstraZeneca, I was fascinated by the idea that we could use those small differences and our scientific knowledge to tailor the best drug for the best patient. So when we select patients, the right patients for the right drug, then the outcomes from clinical trials get better. We're able to see whether clinical trial, whether our drugs are more efficacious and safe. And that makes for a better clinical outcome. And then that makes good business sense. So it's really a win-win situation all around. So for the patient, I think it's a lot about um, them getting a more predictable outcome from the drugs. So rather than them just having to come to the doctor and not knowing whether that treatment will work for them, they will get more of a prediction about whether the drug will work. They don't have to come back time and time again. They try one drug, then they try the next drug, and then maybe they have another drug that could be efficacious, but they have side effects. But they can tell, ideally, the first time that that drug will work for them. So even before the clinical trial starts, we will be doing research to identify the best biomarker for that particular drug. And then when we start doing clinical trials in the patient population, then we will be able to use that biomarker to select the patients. If we know what the biomarker is, we can use a diagnostic test at that stage to pick patients onto the clinical trial. If we don't know, then we can, can be carrying out the research during the clinical trial. When we've looked at those relationships, we've really believed that the best model is to be able to partner with whichever diagnostic company has the technology and other capabilities that are right for the particular drug. So we tend to work with strategic partnerships with diagnostics companies rather than investing in just one diagnostic company. I personally came from a background in genetics and immunology, looking at both the genes and the proteins that make people different. But different people come from different backgrounds. In my group, I have people who came from a physics background. Uh, I have a colleague very high up in a personalised healthcare organisation who was originally a nurse. 
So because this is a new and cutting edge area, I think people can take many different career paths. What's needed, of course, is an enthusiasm for the subject and then an ability to learn and to work within a group that is cutting edge in personalised healthcare. Oncology is probably the furthest ahead. Then I think outside of oncology, you have a progression in the technology used in neuroscience, the imaging techniques in infectious disease, there are developments now coming through in rapid diagnostic testing so that rather than waiting two or three days for the outcome of a culture test, patients will be able to put on to a more effective therapy straight away. We, we will be seeing personalised healthcare as a normal part of drug development and even a normal part of clinical practice so that every patient, when they go to see their doctor, already expect a number of tests, blood tests to be carried out, and that these will include maybe more sophisticated tests so that they will be able to see and the doctor will be able to prescribe the drug that is most appropriate for them, maybe without the patient even being aware of it, but so both their samples and their disease can be treated most appropriately. We're honored to have today as our guest, Jason Silva. Opening up synthetic biology a bit. Yes. Uh, a full, uh, if we were to say look at a wide range of the, the, uh, the areas that fall under synthetic yeah. biology, sure. all the way from synthetic genomics right. uh, through um, molecular modeling used to create artificial biomolecular structures, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, going all the way through the interface of biology and electronics, right. uh, neurons on a, on a chip, learning to communicate in, uh, on their own with the electronic component, using slime molds or DNA structures as a computational architecture, all the way out to Craig Ventner and literally creating artificial life. Well, the first time right. he did it, it was kind of a hack, but the yeah. second time was the real deal. Yeah. Uh, so given that, how, in your view, will synthetic biology help, hinder, accelerate, decelerate uh, our move towards our transhumanist future? Yeah, well, I think... I think we might start off by saying, why even call it artificial life? I mean, at the end of the day, it's life creating life. And if you look at, you know, Buckminster Fuller said, start with the universe. You look at Earth as a planetary system that sprouts life in an organic fashion, then the microchip is just as natural as a flower blooming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a scientist creating artificial life in a lab is no different than, like, you know, an animal having sex with another animal and be, and, or an animal having sex with another of the same species and, and, you know, reproducing natural selection. It's still life creating life. So the whole notion of calling it artificial or non-human or unnatural is silly. It's all natural. The other aspect that excites me about synthetic life is this idea that the canvas for human creativity, okay, is now life itself. I mean, when you consider technology as an instrument of mind expansion, look at uh, like a scaffolding that it extends our thought, reach, and vision. The technology of the microscope, the technology of the telescope, both uh, make us privy of realities that we're ordinarily unaware of, right? They let us see that there's always so much more that we do not perceive. They extend us. Imagine how impoverished humanity would have been if we hadn't invented the technology of the instrument before Beethoven or Mozart came along. Or imagine if we hadn't invented the technology of oil painting and time for Van Gogh to flourish through it. So this idea that now synthetic biology says life itself is the canvas, the new palette that the artist, that human creativity can be funneled through. What might we create? I mean, we who are part of the human species, which is a remarkable species, still kind of emerged not by design, but by natural selection. But imagine now if sentience, if intelligent design can now actually be applied to the canvas of life. So to all those, you know, creationists out there, one might say this is intelligent design at last that we're talking about. Right. And uh, that, uh, that, that's by, what uh, synthetic biology, I think, excites and that's why it excites me. Me too. Uh, and that would be intelligent design accomplished by Homo sapiens, right? Not by some transcendental um, right. entity.
Totally. And, you know, if you, if you extrapolate a future where our minds become decentralized and substrate independent uh, in a way we take on the godlike qualities that people sort of are hopeful for and who are religiously inclined. So rather than this notion of God having created the universe, it's more like this universe sprouted homo sapiens will eventually will sprout technology that makes them substrate independent. So it's, it's low organization, low order matter creating complex entities like humans, which will then create entities that are not dependent on certain types of matter to exist. Mm. So and that it, argument it could reverses be, the thing. Yeah, the argument could be extended to say two things. Yeah. one would be that in fact the self-organizing principle of biological matter created creatures that uh, needed to interpret their sensorium, and so invented metaphysics and religion to offer an explanation to reduce their anxiety over being aware of their mortality. Right. right? So all of that changes, you know, in, over the next few decades. But pushing it out even a little bit more, uh, perhaps I could ask you this. Uh, given that matter self-organizes, becomes biological, turns into us, mm -hmm. and everything we see, as you've said in some of your great documentaries, mm. is us. It starts with the concept and moves yeah. through instantiation, and right. it's out there. Right. And we are witnessing the, as you mentioned earlier, the decrease in lag time between the idea and uh -huh. the actuality. Uh -huh. So if we create artificial life, synthetic life, and that synthetic life is in intelligent and has intention. So then that would, what I want to ask is, wouldn't that create the possibility of that synthetic life at a certain future level of complexity yeah. having its own intentions and its own ability to actualize? Oh, absolutely. And what would that look like? What well, could that look like? Well, it's, it's hard it's, to imagine. It's, 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 it's as hard to imagine as a rich symbolic inner world of metaphysical representational capacities would be uh, conceivable to Homo sapien prior to the invention of language. So that's, uh, that's how inconceivable what this synthetic life might ultimately express itself as is to us. Um, we lack the neural architecture at the moment. Mm -hmm. We can conceive of one way that we might want to design it, but the moment that that artificial life, which again is not artificial because it's just life creating life, but the moment in which this new form uh, of intelligence emerges and it, in it itself starts to design its own evolution, at that point it's difficult for, what, for us to extrapolate what that might look like. Although we keep calling it it and, and them and this other life, that's but true. that's really going to be us. Right, that, 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 whole, that whole notion of false objectification right. is really rampant because right. we have the illusion that we're uh, isolates moving around in an empty space right. when in fact it is, it equinishes our systems. Right. You can't separate the animal from the equinish from the, uh, the relationship between the two and, Absolutely. and all of that. Which is why I tell people just because the iPhone is not physically tethered to me, just because the Blackberry is not within my tissue, doesn't mean that it's not a part of me. It's outsourced cognition. It stores extra memory for me. It helps me mediate with the world. It allows me to have telepathic functions when I send SMS messages. I mean, the Vitruvian man today, as I've said, frontal lobe, neocortex, and in his hand, an right. iPhone. <laughs> and the diagram would point to the iPhone as if it was a part of his anatomy, even though it's not physically tethered to him. We need to get over the skin bag bias. Minds operate in a baffling dance between brains, their environments, and their tools. Andy Clark, Natural Born Cyborgs, said that. So, you know, to finish up this, uh, this one question, um, it gives enti an entirely new layer of beauty and meaning to the, you know, the well-known well phrase that the universe is not only stranger than we imagine, it's stranger than we can imagine. And that is, I would call that a beautiful ending to this segment. Oh, <laughs> well said. Now, if someone would say, for example, um, we are in the process of creating synthetic materials which are uh, living in some form or another, and they will, if released into the environment, be highly persistent, or perhaps even accumulate. You know, if something is alive, theoretically, mm -hmm. it could even reproduce and accumulate. Do you think that requires more oversight 
then those materials which we produce in a in a contained environment and even if the containment would break is there's virtually no cap capacity for persistence releasing synthetic biology based organism in the environment is something that is scary because you don't really know what what would happen to this organism once the spill is cleaned up you don't really know how the genetic material that a uh, human designed and introducing this organism is distributed among other microbes in the environment if we talk about um, microbiology, right? Because often microbes are the ones that are used to clean up environmental problems or spills. Synthetic biology is an emerging field aimed at retooling organisms to fulfill a purpose. It is a rapidly growing field involving multidisciplinary researchers trying to improve the industry by using biologically sourced materials. But before we try to answer the complex questions pertaining to the rise of synthetic biology, let us try to answer a much simpler question. What are synthetic organisms? Depending on what you want to call synthetic biology, I mean, that's, it's, it's been retooled as a, as a term recently, but it's not a new term. I mean, it's first appeared in like, you know, 1908 or something, and then everyone was using synthetic biology, although it didn't catch on the same way in, you know, the 70s, and now it's, I think through no small part um, by a concerted effort to, to, to market this idea and this approach and the name um, has, has gained, I think, a bit more traction. Well, it has definitely gained more traction this time, but in, in a lot of ways it's a logical extension of sort of biotechnology leading up to, uh, you know, the 21st century. So a synthetic organism by definition is something that is entirely made up from unnatural um, components. Uh, so, so the definition really comes down to do we have any organisms that are completely made from by man? Right now we're at the stage where the goal is to create tools. Then the next step is obviously to apply these tools to do something. But then the final step is how do, does the application of these tools impact society in general? Many of these tools are in use today in domestic, industrial, and agricultural applications, such as using GMOs to mass-produce disease-resistant crops. Leading expert Dr. Roberto Chica will introduce us to some of the applications synthetic biology provides in the medical field. Since synthetic biology is so vast, you can think of a lot of different examples where the application of it has been successful for improving the quality of life of people, either uh, through um, you know, agriculture or medicine. So a couple of examples would be, for example, uh, using an engineered enzyme to synthesize more efficiently a desired compound that is then sold. So instead of using, for example, a chemical process which would generate waste that's uh, bad for the environment, you would use this enzyme and the waste would be um, would be less uh, uh, bad for the environment. Uh, another example would be uh, you could potentially cure a lot of diseases with synthetic biology. So a couple of examples are uh, antibodies that are used in uh, therapies. They need to be made somehow, so there are a lot of uh, synthetic biology ways to make these antibodies. Uh, you can also think about um, there's a lot of research being done into engineering bacteria that would specifically target, for example, cancer cells and they would infect these cells over healthy cells and they would get killed this way. Or there are also uh, engineered bacteriophages that kill only certain types of bacteria which are bad for you and not others which are good. So these are all ways that synthetic biology can you know, uh, be beneficial for health and, and agriculture. After that, you, know, you might use synthetic biology to develop new drugs, to develop mm -hmm. new food products, to develop new... Uh, um, sources of energy, you know, there's so many aspects that we haven't even discussed yet. So, for example, you know, you could use synthetic biology to design microbes that produce um, uh, organic compounds that are super energy rich to replace ethanol, to replace, you know, uh, as an alternative way of producing energy. The, the, the way that, that um, it's advanced has been, well, people have realized that there are benefits to use Roundup in their backyards. They do that on a massive scale. So there is a deep penetration, at least in North America, and acceptance that genetic or, or, or modified organisms are okay. 
These and many others are among the success stories of semi-synthetic biology within our modern day lives. However, along with all these advances are also the cons and negatives associated with the production and environmental stability with the utilization of synthetic organisms. Possible side effects are obviously in synthetic biology you're creating a lot of uh, new either molecules or even uh, organisms that may have a property that isn't found in nature. And uh, a possible side effect is that it can start spreading in nature and becoming the dominant uh, form. For example, I mean crops which contain these transgenes, which are resistant to herbicides, for example, they may spread their genes to other plants, right? And this has already, well, I mean, it's already happened that uh, such plants w have spread to other fields where they weren't uh, sown the first time. So because of this, obviously, you, you could have a potential of, of it spreading in nature. And since we don't know exactly what the impact can be, you want to probably limit the spread in nature. So you want to put regulations where, you know, it, they'd be used in a specific context and they'd be controlled so that they don't spread uh, beyond what they're, they're, where they're supposed to be. So in this example, it's basically um, it's a crop of canola, which was resistant. It was engineered to have a resistance gene to a pesticide. And the idea was obviously that you would use this pesticide to kill the other plants and only your canola would survive. So that'd be good. So you could produce more canola and more efficiently without having to worry about uh, other uh, plants that would compete. Now the problem with this is that, so it's a success from an economic point of view. Because obviously somebody's making these plants and selling them and making money out of it, right? Plus you're probably increasing productivity that way. Where it becomes a problem is that these plants spread to a neighboring field and the farmer in question, he didn't know. So he started cultivating these plants and then he got sued by the company because he didn't purchase the rights to use these modified plants. So this became obviously a problem for him and for our legal system because there was no precedent for this kind of, uh, of issue. Uh, and again, I mean, you, don't, you probably wouldn't want all plants to become pesticide resistant. So you'd want to find a way to not have these engineered genes, you know, be transmitted to other uh, plant species. There are experiments, yes. There are experiments where, for example, you know, degradation of organic compounds under controlled condition. You're totally right. And you know, at the scale of a bacteria, it's very easy to do microcosm or, or, or mesocosm experiment, where we've seen that you have designed a bacteria with a superplasmid, for example, because plasmid is a very easy way to transfer information, mm -hmm. genetic information among microbes. Um, yeah, and the bacteria was introduced into um, a soil sample, for example. A few days later, the bacteria is gone, but the ability to degrade the contaminant is there. I would say maybe two things. One is the fast, the pace of technology the harder it is to keep legal structure like regulations mm -hmm. in close, following closely behind. That's just a, a given. It's nothing with any country or any, um, let's say, interest or capacity of people working in these organizations. That's just a given. But there's another issue. Synthetic biology actually does, has raised in the public, for example, the economist, an issue which is not new, but it's probably at a new scale, and that is the whole do-it-yourself, the oversight of do-it-yourself operations. So if you look at this profile overall, you have a similar decline in the price of, of both um, uh, the, the sequencing and the synthesis. Now, the synthesis of genes is maybe a bit more regulated still, in the sense that it cannot be done all everywhere very cheaply, but it's coming rapidly. So you have this capacity which mimics what happened with uh, microchips and, and some other technologies, maybe plastics or them. But on top of that, you have this, what I just said earlier, this theoretical potential for mobility and persistence, not even accumulation. And it happens in a garage, then you really do have a, a new issue. Because if, uh, if from one point source something can spread, it really requires a different level of oversight. Given all these cons, it is only reasonable to doubt whether or not synthetic biology should be considered dangerous. However, there are many differing views on why this shouldn't be the case. We do a lot of science. You know, we already use uh, genetic engineering in the lab every day. It's something very common. And there is already a lot of potential to do things wrong. Mm -hmm. So 
of course, in the lab, it's already regulated. Some of it is already regulated. I think it's the next step. It's really this integration with people and with the environment that really is the hurdle. And this is, you know, the public fear of, you know, the use of those organisms. Look at, you know, the, 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 the fear associated to GMOs, nanotechnologies, stem cell research. It's always the same issues, and it's very important to involve the public into uh, the public, so don't devolve into the scientific discussion necessarily because that's not necessarily um, productive. Yeah. But really make sure that this social and environmental aspect is taken into consideration. I think it's a natural and healthy process that that in a de de democratic society that that it's on the it's a responsibility of the people who know to convey honestly, openly about what it is that is going on. And then it's the responsibility of the public to raise their concerns. And, 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 and I don't see that there's any problem. I, I don't really, I don't know, I, I, I don't think there's any problem. And, it, and it's good to have a fearful, well, I, I wouldn't say fearful, I think it's healthy to have a skeptical uh, ma uh, majority. It's not hard to see that there's a lot of uh a lot of opinions about like genetically modified organisms, especially uh, those meant for consumption. So, um, you know, genetically modified corn or soya or, or, or you know, animals. Just this really sets people's hair on end. It seems, um, and I, I think a large part of it is is a lack of understanding. Uh, people don't understand what these technologies mean or what it means to insert a gene from one organism into another and what. The people just don't even know what that means. It seems from an academic standpoint that the dangers of synthetic biology are merited. And with the apparent permeation into daily scientific lives merging into public products and gaining wide acceptance in the public eye, a problem still remains, that of regulation. But does this mean that we should treat them as harmful until proven safe or safe until proven harmful? I think virtually everyone in the public would say, oh, there should be some kind of oversight. So as soon as you have some kind of oversight, then arguably you have gone from uh, safe under all circumstances to the concept of, of safe when proven, you know, reasonably safe. Mm -hmm. I think as soon as the issue gets raised that way, people will, will generally speaking, every, virtually everyone, perhaps even the researchers say there has to be some kind of Oversight. However, in order for these regulations to be instituted appropriately, both the public and the regulators need to understand the salient differences between synthetic biology and other genetic modifications, as well as have answers to the questions we have on why we need to improve synthetic biology as a field. I think that people maybe don't really, you're right, I don't think, you know, it's, it's maybe it's unclear the difference between recombinant DNA technology GMOs in their tomatoes and corn and synthetic biology. And so, you know, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. Do they have to, you know, they, they clearly are people that are afraid of GMOs. So, you know, then you bring something that is, so the, the difference between GMO and synthetic biology would be one is just recombinant DNA, expressing the DNA of a foreign organisms into a target cell, for example, you know. Synthetic biology creates something that is not even in nature yet, you know, or ever. So, can you imagine the ethical and possible fear associated to that, to the mainstream public that is not necessarily science educated? That's the, the, the issue around the term synthetic biology. You have in half of the expression the concept of novelty, but in a sense also potency building. Because if you create something synthetic, you probably do it for a reason. And on the other hand, you have biology, which sort of implies persistence. And that's kind of a. That sounds a little bit a little bit dangerous because there's no defining feature that distinguishes DNA manipulation, say you would typically do in a in a in a, in a biomedical lab, from synthetic biology. It's the same techniques, it's the same technologies. It's synthetic biology, just doing it smarter and faster and cheaper. So I mean, obviously, there is ethical and philosophical, theological considerations when you talk about synthetic biology, and particularly when you create new forms of life. And, I mean, as a scientist, our first uh, priority or first uh, obligation is to the truth. 
So it's not up to us really to decide whether it's right or wrong. For us, it's to understand how it works. Everybody should be involved in the decision whether it's right or wrong. So I can give you my opinion. My opinion is that synthetic biology, it's not really a question of right or wrong. We should be exploring these things because that's what science is about. It's about understanding. And one way to understand things is to not only observe them, but to create them, to modify them, right? It's easier to understand, a, let's say, a radio if you build it yourself than if you just look at how it works. So I think we should definitely pursue that. Obviously, we should be careful as to what we do. In, we should use it wisely. I believe, the, yeah, I believe the public just senses that things are going at a very rapid pace. The public reasonably mm, would think that change could have a cost. Can change often cost something. Cost of adaptation, cost of risk, uh, the cost of being the wrong person in the wrong place, a personal cost, yeah. you know. And so, sometimes it comes down to asking the right questions and providing the necessary answers in order to quell the public fear. What do we want? Freedom to operate? Uh, free, of, uh, free of bureaucracy? Do they want to make tons of money? Uh, what is it? Is there any concrete things that they want to achieve? Do they, do they want to make new oncolytic viruses to, to kill cancer? What is it? And, and, and unless you come to the point where it's concrete and, and, and saying, this is our objectives, this is what we want to do, you can never persuade anybody not to be suspicious about it. And in some cases, these answers need to correspond to issues with safety regulations in order to prevent a worst case scenario. I think people have been trying to uh, use uh, bacteria that would, you know, commit suicide after replicating a few times. There are some um, safeguards that you can implement that I'm aware of um, in terms of the stereochemistry of some of the proteins that would work on just under a certain configuration, so it would not interfere with whatever is in the environment, it would just do its job just for its target and then wouldn't be able to be used, so the genetic sequence might be picked up, mm -hmm. but it would be silent, they couldn't read it basically. Or even if they were to read it, to produce protein, the protein would be useless because yeah. they wouldn't have the proper substrate. So you know, you could have safeguard at the gene level, and, or at the gene product level, or at the cell level. Obviously, we want to be careful as to how we use the products of synthetic biology, especially when you create a new organism, or maybe not created from scratch, but maybe modify or engineer a, a known organism to do something different. You don't want it to be widespread in nature because you don't know if that organism, organism is going to become the most prevalent one and it's going to, you know, overtake the other ones which are found in nature. So in terms of regulations, I mean, I definitely, I think that the most important thing is for scientists and policy makers to have a better interaction, such that the policy makers have the right information to make their policy. I also think the policy should not be based on fear. It should be based on fact. I'd say thorough risk assessment process, of course, you know, um, make sure that the actors involved in the synthetic biology uh, process, such as the engineers, the, uh, the biologists, the industry that would eventually commercialize this product, talk to each other. You know, keep in mind, you know, always this like cross borderness thing and trying to minimize scientific uncertainty. The problem is that we can't minimize scientific uncertainty. And governance policy development will need to deal with the complexity of the issue. And there will be no easy answer, there will be no simple framework probably to apply because it's so complex. Some scientists have a different perspective regarding regulations. One that suggests that the persistence of the organisms themselves need to be taken into consideration, as well as the survival rate of the organisms within the environment. It's actually reasonable to think about some kind of Pandora's box. If something is truly alive in the sense that very capable of, of reproduction, then by definition there is a potential for persistence. And when, you, when things are persistent in the environment, then they're hard to manage. And when things are hard to manage, you should pay attention before you release it. That's actually reasonable. 
The only trouble is, is that just because it's biology doesn't mean it's persistent. There's a ton of stuff happening which is not really alive, or even if it's alive, it's not I mean, going to last very long. I mean, that has certainly be an argument yeah. for genetically engineered, genetically modified crops that just because they're out there does not mean they have a greater weediness potential mm -hmm. than many weeds. Because actually some of the crops are have a very low capability to become weeds. Typically, a bug that is designed in the laboratory or microbe that is designed in the laboratory to perform a very specific task uh, might not necessarily do well in the environment. And why? Because it doesn't necessarily find its niche. And what is a niche in terms of ecology uh, terms is that uh, it's what it does in the environment and it's the resources it has access to. And this microbes that is designed in the lab might have predators, might not be good competitors, might not find food, um, might not be able to reproduce. And so it might just be able to be active for a very short period of time and hence the risk of it spreading and transferring its genetic material might not be um, as important. But excluding the survival potential of synthetic organisms into real-world ecosystems, scientists also think that there is a parallel to be drawn between the introduction of synthetic organisms into the environment and another naturally occurring phenomenon which can also be factored into the regulation stage. But if something is like I mean, let's say, a, um, a non-indigenous species, you know, the U.S. is called alien species, then you can get from one point source, for example, a harbor, a, a complete invasion of a continent. So if that logic is applied to the technology, you get a high level of concern. And then the second thing is the deliberate creation of dual-use products. And um, arguably, you know, synthetic biology has a greater weapons potential than, let's say, the creation of new plastics or microchips. Obviously, you're introducing something new in an environment that wasn't made to, you know, to accept it and to control it. So you never know exactly what's going to happen with that. So we should be careful. I mean, we talked about the example of the introduction of rabbits in Australia and all the problems that that created. So we would definitely want to be careful as to how we do it. There is a parallel and uh, if, if we learn anything is that we're not going to do it blindly without thinking about the consequences. I think really invasive species could be at least could inform a model about uh, the introduction of you know modified organisms into the environment and there's a there's a very long history of this. We, you know, we've been introduced species all over the world. We've introduced the round Norwegian rat all over the world. Cats are all over the world. Any number of species have gone extinct because of this. Um, yesterday I read an article about uh, freshwater jellyfish in Ontario and in the Great Lakes, um, which of course is not something that is... Uh, there's no freshwater jellyfish in Ontario before, before now. Um, snakehead fish, Asian carp, Australia is just a disaster with invasive species. Yeah, I mean, it's just completely overrun by in in invasive species. So I think, um, you know, again, without getting getting hyperbolic or, or trying to really fear monger, it, it's still a, it's still instructive or it's, it's informative as to what can happen when you introduce a, a novel organism that you know, isn't uh, the ecosystem in, in that region is not, is not accustomed to or doesn't have space for. Um, and, you know, it'll, I, what I imagine will happen is it'll depend. You know, sometimes it'll be fairly benign and there may be instances where it's really, really not. And I think it's, it's, it bears consideration as, uh, as informing models on introduction of synthetic organisms into the environment. Regardless of these problems, there is still hope for the regulation of synthetic biology development and release. Since the pathogens are still, you still have, have to have a host, it has to come from somewhere, and it's not provided to you by just because you can do gene synthesis, you know, just some DNA is not going to be come alive. So, so, so there's still, so there's still that point where you can regulate access to to things that are potentially harmful. Despite all doubts, regulations, and assurances, there is still reason to look forward to the future of synthetic biology and its advancements, why we should do it, and where we need to progress to before using it on a mass scale. Right, so the future of synthetic biology, I think it's definitely continue, going to continue to grow a lot. I mean, right now, you're probably aware they created this uh, 
semi-synthetic life form, right? This new bacterium. And um, I mean, that's just the beginning. There's more and more interest just because of the power and the, um, how can I say, the, all the, the diverse set of things that, that life can do. You want to be able to use that to your benefit. So you want to be able to modify it and use it for a useful application. This is this whole idea of human microbiome that is super exciting. Um, so they're smarter than us because without them we wouldn't be alive. So they use us. You know, this is kind of and and we we kind of think we use them, but they use us to live and to reproduce. And and I guess it's a commensalism, a commensal relationship between us and them. And also because they have already designed through, again, million and billion years of evolution, tools to basically harness any type of energy they can encounter. They can use carbon food. They can use inorganic compound as food as source of energy. They can live at uh, acidic pH, very high pH, very low temperature, very high temperature. It's just unbelievable the diversity of environment and the adaptation uh, that they develop to thrive in those environments. So that's why I think they're quite smart. Things that they do for a living every day in their, you know, very small chromosome, uh, we try to think really hard how we can reproduce that. Yeah, I guess the, the main message for me is that synthetic biology is here to stay. And what we do with it is not only up to the science community, it's up to everybody. The science community's job is to show what can be done and to study what the implications are. But the decision on how to use it, when to use it, that should fall on everybody, on the whole of society. So I hope that there's going to be a good dialogue between people, experts in, in synthetic biology, so the research community, as well as people who understand, you know, policy making or, or have an impact in how society works. So I, I hope there's going to continue to be a good exchange of ideas between these two groups. All research aside, there seems to be a consensus among scientists, however. I think releasing an organism in the environment is completely premature and would be a mistake. Let's just say that. Uh, using synthetic biology to design organisms that can be beneficial to uh, the environment in terms of uh, better alternative uh, source of energy, maybe designing new uh, drugs with better specificity to their targets and so on and so forth, maybe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and the reason why I'm saying maybe it's because it's easier to control in the, in the, in the laboratory. So I think it's going to continue to expand. And I mean, in all areas of research, you know, it's driven by curiosity, the desire to know and to understand. So it's, it's not going to stop. It's going to continue to expand and hopefully the applications will be more beneficial than detrimental. And that way the perception by the public will, will become more favorable. On a, on a chip, learning to communicate in, uh, on their own with the electronic component, using slime molds or DNA structures as a computational architecture, all the way out to Craig Ventner and literally creating artificial life. Although the first time right. he did it, it was kind of a hack, but the yeah. second time was the real deal. Yeah. Uh, so given that, how, in your view, will synthetic biology help hinder, accelerate, decelerate uh, our move towards our transhumanist future. Yeah, well, I think I think we might start off by saying, why even call it artificial life? I mean, at the end of the day, it's life creating life. And if you look at, you know, Buckminster Fuller said, start with the universe. You look at Earth as a planetary system that sprouts life in an organic fashion, then the microchip is just as natural as a flower blooming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a scientist creating artificial life in a lab is no different than, like, you know, an animal having sex with another animal and be, and, or an animal having sex with another 
of the same species and, and you know, reproducing natural selection. It's still life creating life. So the whole notion of calling it artificial or non-human or unnatural is silly. It's all natural. The other aspect that excites me about synthetic life is this idea that the canvas for human creativity, okay, is now life itself. I mean, when you consider technology as an instrument of mind expansion, look at uh, like a scaffolding that it extends our thought, reach, and vision. The technology of the microscope, the technology of the telescope, both uh, make us privy of realities that we're ordinarily unaware of, right? They let us see that there's always so much more that we do not perceive. Help with the diagnosis or with the understanding of the underlying disease that they have. So as a scientist, I've always been interested in the tiny differences between individuals, those little differences to our genes and our proteins that make us who we are. And when I came to join AstraZeneca, I was fascinated by the idea that we could use those small differences and our scientific knowledge to tailor the best drug for the best patient. So when we select patients, the right patients for the right drug, then the outcomes from clinical trials get better. We're able to see whether clinical trial, whether our drugs are more efficacious and safe. And that makes for a better clinical outcome. And then that makes good business sense. So it's really a win-win situation all around. So for the patient, I think it's a lot about um, them getting a more predictable outcome from the drugs. So rather than them just having to come to the doctor and not knowing whether that treatment will work for them, they will get more of a prediction about whether the drug will work. They don't have to come back time and time again. They try one drug, then they try the next drug, and then maybe they have another drug that could be efficacious, but they have side effects. But they can tell, ideally, the first time that that drug will work for them. So even before the clinical trial starts, we will be doing... From the big picture to the smallest detail. From the universe to the building blocks of life. The cellular machinery is a wonder of nature. All the instructions needed for its operation are already contained in our DNA. A code of billions of molecules long, which we barely understand, and that is a crucial factor in diseases like cancer. Understanding allows us to move on to the next stage, healing. The objective of our simulations in the clinic would be to actually test different drugs thoroughly and how they actually behave and how they affect the heart. Uh, so we can actually reduce a lot the number of people that go through clinical testing since we will already know quite a lot about the basic uh, effects and the behavior of them. 2,400 years ago, Hippocrates stated, it is far more important to know the person who has the disease than to know what disease the person has. Today, we know that drugs act differently on each individual. Our next step will be to design personalized medication. Personalized medicine is actually very possible. One of the things uh, we can simulate is the effect of drugs in female or male hearts. They actually behave quite differently. So this is very, very feasible to do, to be able to recreate a single human heart from a patient and actually help. Research to identify the best biomarker for that particular drug. And then when we start doing clinical trials in the patient population, then we will be able to use that biomarker to select the patients. If we know what the biomarker is, we can use a diagnostic test at that stage to pick patients onto the clinical trial. If we don't know, then we can, can be carrying out the research during the clinical trial. When we've looked at those relationships, we've really believed that the best model is to be able to partner with whichever diagnostic company has the technology and other capabilities that are right for the particular drug. 
So we tend to work with strategic partnerships with diagnostics companies rather than investing in just one diagnostic company. I personally came from a background in genetics and immunology, looking at both the genes and the proteins that make people different. But different people come from different backgrounds. In my group, I have people who came from a physics background. Uh, I have a colleague very high up in a personalised healthcare organisation who was originally a nurse. So because this is a new and cutting edge area, I think people can take many different career paths What's needed, of course, is an enthusiasm for the subject and then an ability to learn and to work within a group that is cutting edge in personalised healthcare. Oncology is probably the furthest ahead. Then I think outside of oncology, you have a progression in the technology used in neuroscience, the imaging techniques in infectious disease, there are developments now coming through in rapid diagnostic testing so that rather than waiting two or three days for the outcome of a culture test, patients will be able to put on to a more effective therapy straight away. We, we will be seeing personalised healthcare as a normal part of drug development and even a normal part of clinical practice so that every patient when they go to see their doctor already expect a number of tests, blood tests to be carried out and that these will include maybe more sophisticated tests so that they will be able to see and the doctor will be able to prescribe the drug that is most appropriate for them maybe without the patient even being aware of it but so be it their samples and their disease can be treated most appropriately. We're honored to have today as our guest Jason Silva opening up synthetic biology a bit. Yes. Uh, a full, uh, if we were to say look at a wide range of the, the, uh, the areas that fall under synthetic yeah. biology sure. all the way from synthetic genomics right. uh, through um, molecular modeling used to create artificial biomolecular structures, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, going all the way through the interface of biology and electronics, right. uh, 